Right, I think we're recording. Yes, we are. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sanhedrin Shia officially. I say officially because um, Marcel asked me a question during this week, uh, which was a very good question indeed, and it is relevant to our uh, Gemara. Um, and uh, I'm going to deal with that question today in detail. Uh, and it may be that we actually don't actually get to where we're up to in our Gemara. Um, so that will be a, uh, in keeping with our usual speed, uh, which is very, very slow, we, we, might actually, um, we might actually get to stop today as opposed to very, very slow. Um, but we're going to, first of all, deal uh, in some detail with the question that Marcel asked. And the reason that I want to deal with it now um, is that it is very relevant to the time of year, which is why he asked me the question. Uh, let me uh, share with you uh, Marcel's question. Uh, let me see if I can find the exact question that he asked me here. One second. Okay, where are you? Let's have a look. There we go. Right, let me share the screen. Can you see my WhatsApp screen there? Yes? Okay, here's a question. I don't know if you can see if it's big enough, but what it says here, this is Marcel's question. I have a question for you. How can one say, in the Seder Hatarat Nadarim, that's the annulment of vows, Dayanim Mumchim, uh, uh, which is translated as expert judges. She, and he's quoted here the, the, the uh, words here, which I'll show you in a minute in, in a bit bigger. Shimuna Rabotai Dayanim Mumchim. When the three people are just ordinary congregants. That was the question. Now, let me, um, let me show you the actual words. Can you see those words here now on my screen? I've made it bigger for you. This is the beginning of Hatarat Nadarim. Hatarat Nadarim is the annulment of vows which takes place on Erev Rosh Hashanah. That's why I want to deal with it today, because obviously it's relevant to the time of year. And the idea of Hatarat Nadarim is that the, uh, the Torah goes out of its way to stress the importance of vows. There is a whole tractate called Nadarim, vows, um, and the Torah goes out of its way um, to tell us all about the importance of vows uh, and how uh, one must keep one's word. We've seen in our, sh in our Shoftim Shior uh, what happens when you make a vow, how important it is. You'll remember the story of Yiftach, um, who uh, made this uh, silly vow that wh whoever came out or whatever came out to greet him after his victory would be offered as a sacrifice. And of course, it was his daughter. So, um, and he felt duty bound to uh, carry out that uh, the fulfillment of that vow. Vows are very, very important in, uh, in uh, Judaism. So much so that you will hear people when they say they're going to do something they will specifically say, Bli neder, Bli neder, which means without a vow. So if I say uh, to you, uh, after this year, I'll give you a call or I'll come and visit you, Bli neder, I'm making it absolutely clear that it is, I'm not promising this. Uh, I'm not making a neder. You don't have to say Bli neder or everything, because unless you actually make a neder and make a vow, then you haven't made a vow. But the Belinade, by saying without a vow, that is your yellow line on the platform. Okay, that is your uh, your safety net 
So what you're saying is, for the avoidance of all doubt, that's a, uh, a phrase that the lawyers love, uh, for the avoidance of all doubt, Bli Nader, whatever I'm going to say to you now is without a vow. So you'll hear people say that because vows are very, very uh, important. Now, here's a question um, that for David Marks. OK, uh, and I'm going to be very disappointed, David, if you don't get this, this correct straight away. I had a chat with somebody last night who's a bit of a Tanakh expert, a bit of a Chumash expert. And he asked me, how many Mapic Hays are there in Rishon of uh, Matot? Now, why am I asking you that now? Because the first paragraph, uh, first parasha of Matot deals with exactly this subject of annulling vows. Um, and um, do you know the answer, David? How many Mapic Hays are there? Go on, have a guess. Probably the Bal Balaturim uh, mentions it. No idea. Have a guess. Uh, well, it's not the Gematria of Nader, because that'd be too many. It's a lot. I know that. It's, um, Go on, put a figure on it. 25. They're not a bad guess. My first guess when he asked me was 14. The answer is 35. And uh, the siman that he gave me, because of course it's talking about oaths of a woman, is loch, lamad hay, uh, loch with your mapic hay. Okay, yeah. for everybody else, I apologise for that. That was really just a little um, tidbit for uh, for David because I know he likes these kind of things. Um, so uh, anyway, vows are very important, and um, therefore uh, we don't want to go into Rosh Hashanah the day of judgment, uh, having unfulfilled vows on our hands. So the Chachamim uh, uh, instituted a, uh, a process whereby we could annul vows. And we could do this process called Hatarat Nadarim, of annulling vows. Now, those of you who've ever done this process, it's usually done uh, after Shacharit uh, on, uh, on uh, Rosh Hashanah morning. Um, what happens is you get three people, three men, to sit, in, uh, sit down and one person uh, stands in front of him and reads... Erev Rosh Hashanah, Johnny. Sorry? Is it Erev Rosh Hashanah? Erev Rosh Hashanah, yeah. Erev, Erev, yeah, Erev Rosh Hashanah yeah. morning, yeah. after, yeah. uh, after Shacharit, usually. Shacharit, yeah. It doesn't have to be, it can be uh, uh, before Mincha, it can be whenever you want, but it's traditionally done on Erev Rosh Hashanah morning, uh, and you get three people to sit down, and the petitioner comes in front of him, and he says this, he starts off, Shimu na rabotai dayanim mumchim, uh, now I'm going to ask Leon now to uh, read out from the art scroll uh, the translation of the annulment of vows. It's on page three, Leon, wherever you are. I can't even see Leon now. I think we've lost Leon. He was here before, but it looks like he's, he's dropped off. So I'll do it for you. It says here, this is the art scroll translation. Listen, please. You can see the, the Hebrew words on the screen. Shimuna, uh, listen, please. Rabotai, my masters. Dayanim mumchim. Hey, I've got Leon on the phone here. Hang on a second. Let me deal with Leon. Yes, I just noticed you dropped off, Leon. Uh, we, can't, we can't see you either. You've disappeared. So you come in again. Yeah, okay. I'll let you in again. Okay. Okay, here we go. Let me admit you all. Okay, thanks. Right, so uh, um, they're just coming in now. Um, and I've let Jeffrey in at the same time. So it says here, uh, in the art scroll, it says, um, listen please, my masters, expert judges, Dayanim Mumchim, and I've put that in yellow for you, highlighted it in yellow. And that's Marcel's question. How can we say that they are expert judges when all we've actually done, oh, that's nice, Jeffrey. We can see you. Your camera's working now. That's good. Um, 
So how can we say that these people are Dayanim Mumchim? Julia will remember very care very well because she asked the question a good few weeks ago about uh, the concept of having lay people as judges and experts. Remember, we said that in monetary matters, there had to be expert judges uh, who know the whole laws of, of, uh, uh, of monetary matters. There's no point getting some Shmerel who doesn't know what he's talking about. So first of all, we say, we call these people Dayanim Mumchim, and they're not Mumchim. They're not experts. They're just three people who happen to be in shul that morning. Um, so that's, that's Marcel's question. So I thought that's a very good question, which I had never thought about. Uh, and I thought about it for a minute and I thought, well, it's just being polite, isn't it? I used to have a patient, um, uh, a, a, a very, very nice lady, very uh, holy lady, who always used to come into my uh, surgery and call me rabbi. And I used to say, well, I'm not a rabbi. I wasn't then. Uh, and uh, I said, I'm not a rabbi, I'm a doctor. And she always used to call me rabbi because it was, it was a term of respect. It was the highest term of respect that she could give. Um, and she wouldn't be deterred from, uh, from giving me this, this title. It was very nice of her. Uh, I should really let her know now, shouldn't I, that uh, uh, she can actually uh, call me rabbi correctly for once. Anyway, uh, so I just thought about this just uh, when Marcel asked me the question. And I thought, well, it's just, uh, it's just uh, you know, a courtesy title. Like you see in the Torah where, where Yaakov says to Esau, and he refers to himself as your servant the whole time. Uh, your servant, your servant. He didn't really think that he was uh, Esau's servant um, because he'd received the brachot and he didn't think that he was going to be the servant at all. It was just a term which was uh, a, a term, a, a courtesy term. That's what I thought. But actually, when I looked into it, not true. And uh, I, I want to show you um, a piece of Shulchan Aruch. Okay, I want to show you a piece of Shulchan Aruch. There it is. You all have heard of the Shulchan Aruch, or in our old-fashioned pronunciation, the Shulchan Aruch. Okay, the, the code of Jewish law uh, on which the entirety of uh, modern day halacha is based. Uh, there are uh, other codes of Jewish law, but this is the most famous. And here we have uh, Yoridea 228. And this is Din Hatarat Nadarim, the, uh, the halachot of annulling vows. Vahavdel, but and the difference Shabin Petach Lecharata Vahech. And what it means that between the to, to having an opening to regret having made the oath. Vahech Nikra al Dat Rabin. And how it can be done uh, in, in the correct way, al uh, Dat Rabin, according to the opinion of those. Okay. So this is the Hebrew here, Misha Nadar, Vanit Charet. Somebody who made a vow. Let's look in the uh, let's look in the English translation here. One who made a vow and regrets it can rectify the acceptance of the vow by having remorse. Okay, Charata, or in the old Yiddish pronunciation, Charata. Okay. Somebody, yeah, Leon's nodding. You've ever had charoto about something, Leon? Yeah, it happens quite often. You buy something and you think it's a real bargain and you get it home, it actually turns out to be rubbish and you have charoto. You've got charoto that you bought it. You have regrets that you ever bought this in the first place. Yes, Leon, yeah, you can... Yes, I had charoto for something that I didn't buy and should have done. Ah, that's, yes, that could be even more expensive. Yes. Yes. Those of, you, those of you that didn't buy um, British Telecom shares when Margaret Thatcher uh, uh, privatised the whole thing, uh, you'll all have had charotta for not buying those. That's right. Okay. Johnny, so, excuse, Johnny, Johnny, excuse me. When you said before, if you said, I'll call you after the year, that, that's a, is that a vow or...? 
Or no, it's you have not to a say, vow. I swear by Almighty God. Yeah, how do you make a vow? vow? And that, and that, it's not a vow, and that's why you don't need to say Vlinaid. Yeah, is so how do you make a vow? That's on the platform. But if you were to say, what constitutes I, make, a vow? I hereby make a vow by God's yeah. name to do something yeah. or other, then that's a serious matter. A proper thing, yeah. Even there are some opinions that say, even if you say, I promise to do something without using yeah. God's name. There's an opinion that that constitutes a sort of a vow. So we, we, we shy away from that. Um, for example, for example, um, when, uh, when you go to court uh, as a witness, uh, which I do quite often, I uh, am uh, in, in, in the courts in the UK, uh, the standard uh, thing to do is to take an oath. You, you swear and you get the, you, you're asked whether you want the Chumash, you want the Old Testament, you want the New Testament, you want the Quran, you want whatever it is, and you're meant to put your hand on the holy book and you say, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? That's the oath that you're meant to take when you go there. Now, um, there are people, uh, religious Jews, amongst them and religious uh, uh, Muslims amongst them who don't want to make an oath. That's not to say that they're being tricky and they're not going to tell the truth, but they don't want to make an oath in case by mistake, oh, something Jesus. that they say is not the whole truth and nothing but the truth by mistake. It doesn't mean that they are deliberately going to lie, but they may, inadvertently not say the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And there, they would have thereby um, violated a very serious uh, matter uh, of taking a, an oath and violating that oath. And therefore, in the British courts, and I'll be interested to know what it's like in the Israeli courts and in the uh, South African courts and in the American courts, we've got uh, all sorts here today with us, um, in the English courts, you have an option to affirm, okay? So you can affirm and you can say, without taking the oath, you can say, um, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, uh, without using the holy book and without uh, invoking uh, God's name. Um, now, uh, I've, been in, I've been in court where a certain person, uh, um, a certain person affirmed and did not take the oath. I, by the way, when I go to court, I always affirm because uh, I don't want to take an oath just in case. case. Oaths are very important. So I affirm. So this person affirmed and it was clear to the, to the judge uh, that he wasn't telling the truth. Uh, uh, it, it would actually would have been clear to a three-year-old that he wasn't telling the truth, actually. Um, and, and the judge uh, turned around to him and said, um, Mr. So-and-so, can I remind you uh, that uh, by affirming, that did not uh, mean that you are uh, free from telling the truth. Uh, I remind you that you have affirmed to tell the truth. Uh, and there was an objection from uh, this fellow's uh, lawyer, uh, the, the guy was, uh, he was the defendant in the case and uh, the judge found against him. There was an appeal and the case had to go to a retrial because the uh, fellow's lawyer uh, wanted to say that the judge was biased against the client because he affirmed and didn't swear. The guy was a was a Muslim, and he affirmed. And the guy, the, the, the lawyer wanted to say that this guy was uh, Islamophobic, and because he reminded him that he had affirmed and not taken the oath, that that was showing his Islamophobia, and that he thought that this tricky guy was not telling the truth because he hadn't made an oath. Uh, and the and and the appeal was successful, and it had to go to a retrial, uh, at which he was. Uh, um, he was uh, he lost that case as well, uh, but that's another matter. So uh, um, that's just an interesting aside. Um, so we're very careful about making oaths. Yes, Howard. 
I don't know if I'm anticipating what you're going to say later, but call me Dre, the prayer. You are. You are anticipating. You. Okay. Um, hold, hold the thought. Hold the thought. Okay. So um, oaths are very important. We try and avoid making oaths. And this is an option for us to, um, to annul our oath. Just before we come to that, um, what I wanted to show you, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Leon, have you, is your uh, master an art scroll? Yes. Okay. Has anybody got a Koren Rosh Hashanah master? Okay. Have you got it there with you? Yes. Oh. Johnny, have you got it there with you, in front of you? Just, Johnny can go and get his Koren master. And I'll show you something interesting in the Koran Machta. Um, so um, oaths are very important, and we have this option uh, of Hataratna Darim. But if you see in, in our Shulchan Aruch here, I'll just while Johnny's gone to get his Machta, we'll just read what this says. One who took a Nader and regrets it can rectify the acceptance of the Nader by having remorse. Now, that it's on page uh, page three. It's on page three, Johnny. It's on page three. So it says in the Shulchan Aruch here that in order to undo and ha and rectify the acceptance of the vow, you have to have remorse. In other words, you have to regret having made the vow, even if one took a nader with the name of God. So what should that person do? That is the, uh, this is what the Shulchan Aruch is telling us. Remember, this is the code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch. What should the person do? They should go to a wise Torah scholar. Let's have a look in the uh, uh, Hebrew. Yelech etzel chacham mumche. Mumche, an expert, a chacham mumche. He has to go to an expert, wise person. Remember our, uh, remember our words that we had? We had, Shimuna Rabotai Dayanim Mumchim, expert witnesses. So that's where he gets it from. The Shulchan Aruch tells you, you have to go to an expert. Look at that, it's in the singular. Chacham Mumche, one expert judge, the Gamir, who is very learned, same word as Gemara, Right, the Gemaria, the Savir, and logical. He's wise, he's logical, right? He's an expert, he's a Muncha, he's a Gamir, and he's Savir. Okay, and that's what you have to do. Now, have it looks, and have it looks, look now what the next words of the Shulchan Aruch is. Ve'im ein Yachid Muncha. And if there is no individual who is an expert, Yelech, he should go, Eitzel, two, Shlosha, Hediodot, three simple people, Hediot. It's, uh, sometimes that word means idiot, uh, but it doesn't mean an idiot here. Uh, it means a non-expert. Hediot means a simple, straightforward person. So, uh, an we have a Kohen Hediot. Person. Do we have a Kohen Hediot? We have a Kohen Hediot. We have the Kohen Gadol. Uh, the, 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 and then we have a Kohen Hediot, the ordinary Kohen. So, an idiot. means an ordinary person. Here, the, the, the Hediot is not a Mumcha. However, he's not an expert. However, he does have to be de Gemiri, he has to be learned. What does that mean? It means he has to know the halachot. Um, and also, he has to be svire. He has to have logical deduction. He has to be able to deduce what's going on. So you can't go to somebody who is, uh, you know, somebody who's in a coma. Right, somebody who's, who's not got any knowledge or who's not got any logical deduction, somebody who couldn't deduce what's going on. The gam yod, yodim, they also have to know liftach 
Lo petach. Okay, the word petach means an opening. You know what liftoach is? It's to open. How do you open a door? With a mafteach, with a key. It's the same root. Okay, to open an opening. So these head your thought, these ordinary people who are not experts, they still have to have a modicum of learning. They have to have logical deduction. And they also have to have to know how to open an opening. Translated over here, if there's no expert, one should go to three average people. These should be people who study with logical inferences and deductive reasoning and who also know how to find loopholes. Okay, liftach lo petach. What you've got to find a loophole. Veyatiru lo, and therefore can release him, right? The word yatir from, we say every morning in our brachot, matir asurim. Asurim. Matir asurim, he who releases those who are bound up, releases the prisoners. So you will get released. He's got to be released from his vow. So he goes on to say, the ha'idna, and nowadays, ein mumche. There is no person who is expert enough, sheyehe ra'ui, who is fitting lahatir b'yachid, to um, release vows on his own, as an individual. So, we have to go to three average people, but they have to be people who are able to learn, who understand the halachot, who have deductive reasoning and know the loopholes. Now, do you think that the three people that you sat before when you did your Hataratna Darim last era of Rosh Hashanah, do you think that they fit, or fitted, if that's a word, into that category? Do you think, no. do you even remember who those three people were that you did your, uh, um, your Hataratna Darim for? I very much doubt whether the majority of people before whom we all stand to do our Hataratna Darim are uh, people who fall into this category. So what is this all about? But before I go on to that, John has come back now with his Koren uh, Mahzon. Uh, and tell us, readers, Johnny, please, very carefully, including punctuation marks, the beginning of Atarat Nadarim in the Koren Mahzon in Hebrew. Shimu no Rabotai, then in brackets, Dayanim Bamunchim. Ah, okay, and in the English, please. <laughs> Listen, please, my masters, and in brackets, expert judges. So, the Koren Machzor... Every vow or... Oh, oh. Thank you for that. The Koren Machzor yeah, goes okay. to the trouble of putting Dayanim Mumchim, these words here, in brackets. Art scroll does not, neither does Birnbaum, I'll save you the bother of looking, neither does Routledge, I'll save you the bother of looking, and neither does Chabad, because this is where I got this from. Okay, uh, so uh, Koren goes to the trouble of putting it in brackets because Koren recognizes that uh, we're not Mumchim, we are not Dayanim Mumchim. So what's it doing there? So we come back to Marcel's question. What it means is not that we are Dayanim Mumchim in that we are the Mumche that we're talking about here that you can go to as an individual. But what it means is that we are uh, assuming that these three people standing before us are expert enough to fall into this category that they are average people with learning, deductive skills, and know how to find loopholes. Now, even though, even though Art Scroll does not put it in brackets, it does not believe 
that these people are in fact experts and I will show you, I will prove that to you in a moment. Okay. Johnny, now. this is Sharon and I have a question. Okay. Are, are you going to address the loophole language? Just about, just about to do that now. Okay, because I have a thought on it. I won't share it now. Okay, so they have to know the loopholes. Now, what is the loophole? Uh, to find the loophole, um, we have to go into the next bit of uh, uh, the Shulchan Aruch. Okay, and uh, it is not translated here, so I'm not going to go into the, the Hebrew. I'm going to tell you about what, what the halachot are. We can actually uh, find this in the text of Hatarat Nadarim. Leon, have you got your art scroll ready there? Yes. Okay, if you could uh, read us the text in English of the, uh, the Hatarat Nadarim, um, starting from... Starting from Okay, starting from, I suppose, uh, halfway through the first paragraph where I'm looking for a full stop. There isn't one, is there? Uh, there's a word there, uh, halfway down the word myself at the beginning of a line, followed by a semicolon. Can you see that? No. Page three, uh, page three, halfway down the page. Yes. The first word of the line is myself, and then it's followed by a semicolon. No, it must be a later print. Uh, Okay. There's no, it, there's no it, line beginning myself. Okay. It, it's, I'll read it to you then. It says, it's going on, it's saying all the kind of vows that I've made and any utterance that escaped my mouth or that I vowed in my heart to perform on ah. any of the various optional good deeds or good practices or anything else, blah, blah, blah. The thing that I did related to myself is both regarding vows that are known to me and those that I have already forgotten, regarding all of them, I regret retroactively, and I ask and request of your eminences an annulment of them. Right? So he says clearly, I regret them. The, he the Hebrew word is itcharatna, which you will remember from Kol Nidre, because we have the same word. You'll remember this, the, the tune of, of that. We have a very similar word, itcharatna, from the word charata. So I regret them. I regret having made these things. And I regret them retroactively. That means I regret them from the time I made them in the first place. Now, why does he say I regret them from the time I made them in the first place? Because the, the, the problem is that, in fact... Uh, if you go now, uh, Leon, I'm sure you'll be able to find this. Um, um, you'll see, Leon, later on it says the judges repeat three times. Yes. Now, immediately before that, there's a paragraph that says, now behold. Yes. Read that for us and listen carefully, everyone. Now behold, according to the law, one who regrets and seeks annulment must specify the vow. But please be informed, my masters, that it is impossible to specify them because they are many. Stop there. No, do Stop there. That's important. So what he says is, or what we all say, when we do this annulment, is I regret making all these vows. And uh, really, according to the law, I have to specify the vow and I have to tell you why I regret it. 
and you have to find me a loophole that I can get out of it. I can't just say, oh, I didn't mean it. That's not good enough. You have to find me a loophole. And what the loophole will be is this. It goes like this. I vowed to, let's say, I vowed, I had a, I had a machlokas with somebody. I had an argument with somebody. And I vowed never to go and visit that person. I'm never, how many times have you heard this? I'm never speaking to him again. Right? I'm never speaking to that person again. And you did that in the form of a vow, let's say. Right? Now, turns out later on that actually what he did to you wasn't so bad. And actually, he didn't really do anything to you. And you've got the wrong end of the stick. But you've now made a vow that you're never going to speak to him again. So you have to go to do Hatarat Nadarim. And you would have to go to these judges and say, I regret making that specific vow that I'm not going to speak to Yankel because I didn't realize at the time the real circumstances. Had I known the correct circumstances, I would never have made the vow in the first place. And then the judges can say, ah, I found you a loophole. You made a vow under false pretenses. You were under the, uh, the false impression that Yankel had done X, when in fact he'd not done X. And had you known that he hadn't done X, we accept that you would have never made that vow in the first place, and therefore we will uh, uh, annul that vow because it wasn't a proper vow retroactively. In the first place, it was never a vow because it was only a vow uh, made on the basis that Yankel had done or said X, when now we know that wasn't the case. So they now have found a loophole. You've given them a loophole to get you out of it. So why, why, can't, we, why can't we just do that on our own? If, if okay. we, Hang if, on one sec. Hang on one sec, uh, Nahum. I'll, I'll come back to answer that question, question. But we've got a big problem with our Hatarat Nadarim. We've got two problems. The biggest problem of all is what Leon has just read out. Read that sentence again for me, Leon, please. It's so important. Uh, from May now behold, speak. now Sorry. behold, yeah, now behold, according to the law, one who regrets and seeks annulment must specify the vow. But please be informed, my masters, that, that it is impossible to specify them because they are many. So, if you can't specify the vow, how can you specify the circumstances? which will an allow the judges to say, ah, I found a loophole for you. you uh, I can annul that vow because the circumstances that you thought uh, were pertinent that caused you to make the vow didn't exist. Now, the, the, you can't do that. If you can't even remember the vow, how can you say, I regret the vow because of X, Y, and Z? I can't even remember what it was. So according to the law, and we say this clearly, according to the halacha, according to the law, you're meant to specify the vows. So then go to the next sentence, uh, Leon. Nor do I seek annulment of those vows that cannot be annulled. Therefore, may you consider as if I had specified them. So what you're asking, you're asking these judges to uh, give you carte blanche to annul your vows neged halacha, in contravention of the halacha. The halacha on the darim is very, very severe. We know that because uh, we've got a whole uh, tractate on it. We've got Loads of sucking. We've even got 35 mappic hays in one parasha on it. Okay, I mean, it's, there's loads of it. And you're now asking these judges 
first of all, who are not experts, uh, you're asking them to put aside these very, very important halachot and to annul your vow. Despite the fact you can't even remember what they are, you can't specify them, you can't give them any uh, opening to annul those vows, you can't give them any loopholes because you can't even remember the vow. Um, and we've just seen in the, hala, in the Shulchan Aruch that these people need to be able to find a, le- a loophole. You have to be able to give them a chance to have a loophole. And you can't do this. You're saying it outright, you can't do it. So what is this whole Hatarat and the Darim all about? Uh, yes, Johnny. Does not Adam Lechavero go into the man himself, apologizing, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. That must okay. be, that's a massive thing to do. That's a massive sure, thing to do. For sure, the, the halacha says very clearly, and so does the Hatarat and the Darim, that it doesn't help. If you, if you, uh, um, you know, if you've done something to somebody else, you have to get their uh, forgiveness. You have to ask forgiveness for them. Here yeah. we're talking about vows, uh, halachic vows, getting out of the halachic vow. Um, so, um, yeah, but so you what, vowed to do something not nice against this fellow. So you go going back and say, I'm sorry, you know, I made that vow. Let's be pals. I'm really so sorry about it. Yeah, well, you would Please still give have to me do forgi- like- you're right, you have to do that, but you still have to do Hatarat and the Darin. Both, okay. But at least in that situation, you know the vow that you made, yes. you can specify yes. it, and you can tell the Dayanin why you want it and all, right? Because you've made it to the guy, right? You've gone, you've made yes. Sholem, you no longer want to do that nasty thing to him. So they can say, fine, your vow no longer applies and we can annul your vow. But here, we can't do that because yeah. it's, we, we can't specify. So what is this process of Hatarat and Darim all about? Before expert judges or non-expert judges, it seems that the whole thing is a bit of a sham. And if you've ever done it, or if you've ever seen it done, it is a sham. Nachum, right? It's a sham, right? Well, I, I don't feel that I can define it that way, but it, it makes me feel that way. Right. I, okay. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just... That's a good enough answer I'm, for me. That's a well, good uh, enough uh, answer Let's use but, a different but, you term, know, Johnny. I don't mind, I, I don't mind when, when Yom Kippur, when we pray and we say all forced vows. Okay, we'll, co- we'll, that, come, to, that, we'll come to that Colby Dre in a minute. Clearly. We'll come but to Colby this, Dre soon. Come, okay. come to call me Grace. Yes, David, you want to call it something else? Yeah, let, let's say that we're doing it symbolically. Okay, very good. You, you, you stole the words off me again. Okay, you know my style by now. I like you to, to take you down one road and then bring you back down a slightly different one. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's a nonsense. We're not, we're not we're doing any, any halachic uh, procedure here. We are uh, not annulling vows at all because we can't specify them. And importantly, we make it very clear that we can't specify them. Now, I will ask Leon to put his glasses on because it's small print. Uh, Have a look, uh, Leon, if you will, please. Um, In the, where is he? Is he still with us or we lost him again? I think we've lost Leon again. Leon's having internet trouble. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. This is the commentary in the Ark Scroll Master. Those of you who've got an Ark Scroll Master, if you want to have a look at it, it's on page three under the line. It's in the commentary. It says here, likewise, annulment is valid only if it involves... Uh, uh, so. Also, for an annulment to be effective halachically, the regrets must be complete and preferably be accompanied by a valid reason for regret. And as the declaration itself makes clear, the halacha requires that the vow be specified to at least one member of the court. Consequently, the present declaration must be understood not as a halachic annulment, but a means as a means of repentance from the sin of having abused vows. So in other words, it is not 
an annulment of the vow. It is symbolic, as David said, it is symbolic of us understanding the seriousness of, uh, here's Leon again, hang on a second. Yes, Leon, can I let you in again? I can't see you in the waiting room even at the moment. Okay, I'll, I'll let you in when you come. So, um, so uh, it's symbolic of uh, annulment of the vows. It's not a halachic annulment of vows. It is, um, it is uh, only symbolic, and it is a recognition of how important vows are, and it is a recognition that we have probably abused those vows, and it is a recognition that we have done that Avera. It's a bit like saying al Khait. And there is an al Khait on saying the Darim. I can't remember the exact words of it off by heart. But there is an al Khait that says, I regret all the vows that I, will have, I have made. Uh, and that's what this Hatarat and the Darim is all about. So I want to disabuse you of the notion that when you do the Hatarat and the Darim on Arab Rosh Hashanah, you are doing anything halachic. You are not doing anything halachic. And therefore, the uh, uh, question that Marcel asked, which was a very good question, because according to the halacha uh, that we had learnt, the dayanim, there is a difference between dayanim mumchim and dayanim hediotim. So here we have the Shulchan Aruch, which I've shown you, shows that if you have a real mumcha, you only need one judge. But the Shulchan Aruch, written in the 16th century, says nowadays, in the 16th century, uh, there weren't anyone expert enough to do it on their own. And therefore we go to three, but they are expert to a degree. They're not three monkeys or three morons. They are three people who have to have a learning. They have to understand the halachot. They have to have logical deduction and they have to know how to apply uh, the uh, logic that I've just spoken to you about in order to uh, uh, annul their vow on the basis of, uh, of finding a loophole that the circumstances that pertained the, when you made the vow weren't actually the circumstances uh, that really existed. Now, most of the time, those Dianim are not in that category. And secondly, we do not... Uh, uh, nullify, uh, we do not specify our vows, and therefore this whole process is only symbolic. Despite, I'll come to you in a sec, Nachum. Okay. Despite the fact that we actually go through something which appears to be a legal process, and that is that after the person has said what he said, that really I should specify all these vows. And, uh, and, and, and I can't, I'm asking you to act as if I had specified it. So what you're in effect, if you think about this, what you're asking these simple three guys who are not experts in anything, you're asking them to stop and put aside a very, very important Torah law. Now that's massive. And that's why the art scroll commentary is so important to explain to us that actually this is not a halachic, uh, halachically valid uh, exercise. But we go on as if it were a halachically valid exercise, because then if you have a look, Leon, if you could read out the instructions to the judges in tiny little print there uh, after the words you've just read out. May everything be permitted no, before you. Before that, the instructions... May everything forgiven. be forgiven you. May everything be allowed you. There does not exist any vow, oath, Nazirism, cherem, prohibition, konam, ostracism, excommunication, or curse. But there does exist pardon, forgiveness, and atonement. And just as the earthly court permits them, so may they be permitted in the heavenly court. Okay, so the judges say, okay, 
you're off. It's all clean. Just read out for us, Leon, the instruction to the judges immediately before that paragraph you just read in small print. The judges repeat three times. The judges repeat three times. That's a halachic requirement that you repeat the verdict three times. The reason being, of course, in case somebody hearing it might mishear it. Unlikely you're going to mishear it three times. So we pretend that we're going through a halachic process. We pretend that this is a halachically valid uh, um, process. Uh, Art Scroll notes point out very clearly that it's not. It's only symbolic. Uh, and I think it's very important that we recognize that it's only symbolic. The reason for that, of course, is that if you think that it is really a halachic uh, uh, annulment of vows, we might not be quite so careful with our vows in the future. And so therefore, we have the next bit of Hatarat Nadarim, which we'll come to after we've heard from Nachum and Johnny. Nachum first. Well, couldn't we remedy this, uh, this problem by having certain people in the community to be labeled a person who could carry out this, this behavior? Like we, we give people the right to be a rabbi, we give people uh, certification that they've done something kosher. C couldn't we do the same thing with this so it wouldn't be so, uh, so yes. obvi obviously a sham, you know? And, yes, and like it, yes is the answer. Uh, and we do. Remember, there are two problems here, Nachum. Problem number one is that the Dayanim are not mumchim. And problem number two is that you can't specify the vow. Now, you can't get over not specifying the vow unless you can remember every single promise that you ever made during the year. You can't get over that. But what you're suggesting does exist. Let's say, and I know of a case, I'll give you an example of a case that happened. There was a fellow who came to Manchester from another town a rabbi who um, considered himself to be very holy and made a vow that he would not eat in anybody else's house, right? From a point of view of kashrut, he would not eat in anybody. He made a vow. And um, this person, uh, this person... Linda. This person Linda. was, a, uh, was a, a, a friend of mine, a neighbor of mine, actually. And um, we made, one day, we made Sheva Brachot. Eli Sheva and I made Sheva Brachot for the grandson of the Manchester Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Kupitz. You may remember Rabbi Kupitz from those of you from Manchester. Uh, Rabbi Kupitz's son got married, and we were honoured with making Sheva Brachot. We were very close with Rabbi Kupitz, and we made Sheva Brachot for Rabbi Kupitz, uh, for Rabbi Kupitz's son. And at this Sheva Brachot were sat Rabbi Kupitz, the Chatan, the Chatan's grandfather, the Manchester Rosh Hashiva, uh, Rav Segal, who was a big tzaddik, um, two out of the three Dayanim of the Manchester Bet Din, and this fellow who had made a vow uh, not to eat in anybody's house. Okay, so we f serve out the food, and the Manchester Rosh Hashiva gets tucked in, Rabbi Kupitz gets tucked in, the Dianim of the Manchester Bet Din get tucked in, and this fellow is sat there like a lemon, and he can't eat because he's made a vow that he's not going to eat in anybody's house. And it was very uncomfortable for him. And actually, he, he made, uh, uh, made a, 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 an excuse and made his exit. And I understand that. It was very difficult for him because people are going to say to him, why aren't you eating? And what's he going to say? He said, I'm from than the Manchester Rosh Hashiva, or I'm from than Rabbi Kupitz, and I'm from than those day on him, because they're eating, but I won't eat. It would have made him look very silly. So he made his excuses, and away he went. 
And afterwards, he realized that he'd made an error, that this vow was not something which was a sensible vow. Uh, he thought it was at the time. And he then went to uh, the Bet Din. I don't know which Bet Din it was or who was on that Bet Din, but it will have certainly been people who fell into the category of our Shulchan Aruch here. They would have certainly been people who could learn, who knew how to deduce logic and who knew the loopholes. It would have been Dayanim Mumchim for the purpose of this. And he had that vow annulled. Uh, and it was an official annulment. So, Nachum, to answer your question, yes, that, that has already been done. People are recognized to be able to do that. But he had to go and specify the vow and exactly what it was and how he made it in order to give them, look at this, liftoach lo petach. He had to open for them an opening. He had to give them an opportunity to find a loophole. Now, with our process, Erev Rosh Hashanah, we can't do that because we can't even remember the promises. And we say so. We cannot specify the vows. So just having expert witnesses, wouldn't, expert judges wouldn't help us, which is why the whole process t- takes place in front of every Tom, Dick and Harry, because it makes no difference whether they're experts or not. The fact that we can't specify the vows itself makes it uh, an invalid procedure. Which brings me to the final answer to Marcel's excellent question, and that is, why does it say Diane in Mumchim? Because it is, the answer is exactly how I thought the answer was at the beginning, without knowing why I thought that answer was. The answer is, it's a courtesy title, because this whole process is not a halachic process, it's not halachically valid, it is symbolic, and it is only a recognition that we should take our vows very seriously, and it is a recognition that almost certainly, at some level or other, we have not kept our word during the, uh, during the, the, the past year. And that is, uh, uh, and that is, is why it says, Diane in Mumchim, and that is why the Koran has gone to the trouble of putting it in brackets, brackets to tell us that actually uh, you're not really experts. So it doesn't actually matter uh, that we stood in front of Tom, Dick and Harry uh, and did this process because it's not a halachically valid process. Jonathan, okay. this is really Sharon, you wanted to say something. Sharon. No, I want to ask you a question. In the example of the uh, man who had taken the vow to eat in no one else's home, you said that he went in front of three mumchim, dayanim mumchim, and they found a loophole. Why would dealing with that vow require a loophole as a, uh, in, in order to achieve an annulment, or is a loophole the only way that you can annul a vow? Correct. I don't understand the, the what you said. The and does a, loophole, does a loophole mean um, sort of being tricky or clever as the Israelis speak of it? Or does a loophole mean uh, who can take uh, halacha and think a chutz ha out of the box? What Which is- does it mean? Because one has, to me, a very almost anti-Semitic connotation. And the other, of course, is startup nation connotation. How do you okay. go with that? Okay, so I think the problem is with the in- use of the English word loophole, which has a negative connotation. If you look here in the Hebrew, it says liftach lo petach. Give him an opening. So you can't just say, I regret a vow and therefore I- it should be annulled. You have to have a logical reason why that vow should not stand. That's the whole point of this. So the loophole means I have to find a reason that will say to me, had you known this particular circumstance, you would not have made that vow in the first place. And therefore, I am saying that retrospectively, if you'd have known that, you would have never made the vow. And therefore, it's as if You didn't make the vow. That's what it means by loophole. It's not being tricky. It's not being negative. 
It is being, it is being halachically correct. On the contrary, it would be very easy to do what we do at Erev Rosh Hashanah and say, Hakol Mutalach, Hakol Mutalach, Hakol Mutalach. Everything's allowed. Do what you want. Promise what you want. Say what you want. And then we'll just annul it at a later date. Absolutely the opposite is true. And that's why he had to go to these experts and he had to explain to him, to these experts, why it was that he, he, he had made the vow and why it was that he now thought that that vow was incorrect and why he would like to undo it. So it's a good question that you asked, but I think the question comes from the English use of the word loophole, which has negative connotations. It's not a negative connotation here. For example, if you were to say to me, selling chametz on, Pet on Pesach, is that a loophole? Yes, that's a loophole. That's got negative connotations to me and I try not to do it. Here, this is completely the opposite. This is taking the halacha very, very seriously and not using trickery to get out of vows. Yes, Howard. Well, Howard, do you remember the lawyer called Mr. Loophole in Manchester? I don't work with got all the footballers off the speeding uh, offences. Right. Mr. Don't, Loophole. Don't, don't start, I'm a city supporter. This, all of this is, <laughs> a, is as of nothing as compared with the blanket absolution that we confer on ourselves. Heir of Yom Kippur, that is on Kol Nidra night, with the Kol Nidre prayer, okay. which has caused us no end of problems over okay. the centuries with our detractors. Okay, that is absolutely true. And uh, I did promise you that I would come to Kol Nidre, but it won't, yeah. it won't be today because it's already yes. 20 past 11. Um, yes. I am going to do a series of uh, Shiurim on Sunday morning instead of the Shoftim Shiurim. Uh, for the next three Sundays, I'm going to do uh, Yomim Naraim type things. Um, and uh, I think rather than, um, rather than do it in the Gemara Shia, which has uh, limited uh, attendees, we've got 15 at the moment, usually get about another 15 on, the, on, the, uh, on catch up. I think I'm going to address that issue of Kol Nidre in one of the three uh, Sunday Shiurim. So if I can ask you to hold it, uh, uh, Howard, I will deal with that point in detail. I will um, build on what we've said today about Hatarat Nadarim uh, when, it, when we do that Shiur on Kol Nidre, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, text of Kol Nidre. Um, I'll do a very quick, uh, at that time, I'll do a very quick summary of what we've said today and build on that and talk about Kol Nidre. So you're right to raise that, Howard. You're right um, to raise the questions. Uh, and we will see that we have similar issues that we have uh, to what we've spoken about today. Uh, and there are things that the rabbis did to address those issues. And, and I'll just leave it at that for the moment, okay? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you think of Commentary Magazine, but there's a fantastic article about 10 pages long. On oh, what this magazine? Com it's in the chat. Uh, commentary Magazine. You have to copy it quickly. If right. You want to, because I'll, have when... a I'll have a look. Thank you. I'll just copy oh, that now. Yeah. Uh, have a look at the chat. Howard has sent you a link. Which, if you copy and uh, paste it Actually, to some just, document or other, you'll well, okay. well, 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 get it. Yes. Um, I'll, 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 I'll paste it and send it round uh, when I send the link. Okay. Yes. Uh, where are we now, Johnny? Uh, John, was the alchet you were looking for? Alchet shekatanu lefanecha with shuat shav. Shuat shav would do. Yes. Shuat shav, a false oath. Um, um, yeah. That's not actually a false. That's not actually a, a, a broken promise. That's a false oath. No, that's okay. not the one I'm looking for. That well, okay. means that means telling. That means making a, an oath about something you know to be false. That's not about right. breaking your promise. Uh, okay. Have, have another look for me. See if you can find it. Uh, uh, can can I, can I ask, yeah. Um, in the example that you've just given us about the rabbi in Manchester. 
it wasn't a very sensible oath to make. He sort of took a very high-handed attitude, and yet you indicate that he was probably uh, released from it. Although, I mean, his, the loophole was no doubt that he didn't really uh, realise that Manchester community was orthodox enough for him. But it's very poor ground. Yiftach, who you referred to right at the beginning, who lost his daughter, he, why couldn't he go and look for an annulment okay, and say so it was a mistake? Right. Well, uh, I know we're going over time, but um, I suppose you could all leave if you wanted to. Let me answer that question then before we, we, we close. Um, the rabbis ask exactly that question, Julia. And they are very critical of two people. They're critical of Yiftach for not going to the Mumche at the time and asking for annulment of his vow on the simple ground that it was a silly vow he did not realize the consequences of his vow. It wasn't what he intended. I mean, it would be very simple for, uh, uh, for that to vow to be annulled on the basis of uh, a loophole that could be found. Let's not call it a loophole, an opening that could be found. So um, the rabbis are very critical of Yiftach. The commentators all ask your question. And they're critical also of the mumcha of the judge at that time, of the senior person alive at that time who could have annulled that vow. And that person was Pinchas, none other than Pinchas ben Aaron Hakoin. Okay? Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Hakoin, sorry. Uh, the Pinchas, the grandson of Aaron, who was still alive at that time. He was the senior person. And the rabbis are critical of Pinchas. And they say, why didn't Pinchas... Everybody knew about this vow. Yiftach was the leader. You know, you can imagine it was a proper scandal. Yiftach's now about to slaughter his daughter, or according to some opinions, send her off into, uh, into the forests forever, to a monastery or something. Uh, everybody would have heard about it. Why didn't Pinchas pick up the phone to Yiftach or get on his donkey and go to Yiftach and say, Yiftach, you dumbo, why did you make such a stupid vow? Let's do Hatarat Nadarim. And the, the rabbis are critical of both. They ask the question, why didn't Pinchas do that? And why didn't Yiftach go to Pinchas? And they say that this is what happened. Yiftach said, I'm the leader. It's the pasnished for the leader to go to the coin. He should come to me. And the coin Gadol, Pinchas, Ben Alazar, Ben Arona Kohen, says, I'm the coin Gadol. Pasnished for the coin Gadol to go to an Amoretz like Yiftach, who remember, Yiftach started off life as a brigand. Okay, he was a thug. So Pinchas says, I'm not going to him. I'm the Kohen Gadol. And Yiftach says, well, I'm not going to him. I'm the leader. And neither went to the other. And poor old Yiftach's daughter was the victim of that pride. So the rabbis all speak about this. And they use it as an example uh, of how pride uh, can... Uh, ruin people's lives, can ruin your own life, it can ruin other people's lives. Um, and the, the idea of Hatarat Nadarim is brought down very clearly in the, uh, by the commentators uh, with the story of Yiftach. So your question uh, uh, of 2020 is a, a, a question that's been asked many times before. You're in very good company, Julia. You, we can now give you the title of mum, mum chit, Mumcha, I suppose, or Mumchit, I don't know what the X would be, uh, uh, for, for, that, for that question. Okay, any other points before we go? Yes, David. Yeah, just one pasuk from this week's parasha, 
that uh, avoids all problems. If I read it, the chitech lindor, if you refrain from making vows, lo then you won't uh, come to sin. Okay, that's in this week's Sedra, is it? Yeah. So, okay. um, chapter they, 23, verse 23. How many times do we find that things uh, are, are so apropos like that? Mm. Uh, so there you are. If you don't make a vow... I remember being told as a, as a junior doctor, stop doing tests. You're doing too many tests. If you don't take a temperature, you can't find a fever. Um, I, and I guess this falls into the same category. If you don't make a vow, then you don't have all these problems in the first place, which is why, and we come right back to the beginning, which is why you will hear people who are very particular say, Bli Neda all the time. My, one of my daughters-in-law, uh, Liat over in Australia uh, uh, can hardly say two sentences without Blinada. Uh, and she's right, of course. Uh, she's very careful to say Blinada at everything so that she does not have uh, that problem. And she is fulfilling that pasuk uh, to a very high level. Um, and uh, uh, Blinada means without a vow. And you're absolutely making it clear that there's no vow. Yes, Marcel. Unmute, unmute, Marcel. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for, for answering the, que the question so aimably. Very, very good. But what I wanted just to say is, in conclusion to what you were saying, that it, it's a kind of a sham. It's not exactly a, a, a proper based in at all. Maybe there's another way to look at it, that the person has done, is, is doing real teshuva, and he's got three witnesses to, 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 to accept that he's doing three, uh, real teshuva. What do you think about that? I, I think that's what the art scroll is saying, actually. If I re read you again the art scroll commentary, it says, Consequently, the present declaration must be understood not as a halachic annulment, but as a means of repentance from the sin of having abused vows. So I think the art scroll agrees with you. That uh, and 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 maybe the bet din there is is to give it some kind of uh, importance, some kind of you know uh, symbolic authority. So I think you're right, and I think David is right as well when he used the word symbolic. But I think it's important that we recognise those things uh, and that it is not a halachic uh, thing, which we will come to in due course when we talk about Kol Nidre. Mm -hmm. John. Lee. Uh, Robert, can I speak? Yeah, go ahead, John. Johnny, in the, in the Karen uh, matter on page four, Rabbi, Soloveitchik, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik explained that the annul annulment of vows is similar to the process of repentance itself. So it's similar to what you just That's said. Right. And then he goes on to say, We yeah. express karata. I'll say, Rabbi, at the bottom of the page. Yeah, yeah I can see. He then the next sentence says, We express karata. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, it's a stained process. So Teshuvah yeah. requires harata, as does Hatarat Nadarim. So yeah, that, 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 that fits in nicely as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we better stop recording or else the people that are watching this will, uh, <laughs> will, will get bored. So I'm going to stop recording now. Uh, and